Uh, thanks a lot for that, Chris. Uh, always appreciate spending time with you and, and Vanessa's group as well. And ooh, Vanessa, Vanessa, I just want to say thank you for uh, another invitation to the Ag Breakfast, and you let me speak this year, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, in the spirit of, of Jake's um, hope, you, you know, the, the ethanol industry is doing pretty well right now and, and have done pretty well for the past two or three years. Um, we do remain a commodity-based business, and much like corn farmers, we're used to the, the, the machinations of the market and, and a lot of volatility, but just not to get too statistically heavy, and I know Krista had a, some of the same statistics that, uh, that I was going to quote, but um, you know, if we look at our production from the ethanol uh, industry last year, we produced about 16.1 billion gallons of ethanol. Um, now, obviously, during the COVID years, things went down for a year to, to two years. Um, but at 16.1 billion gallons, um, that's going to be one of our largest production years uh, to, uh, year to date. Um, corn usage on that, and this is correct there, 5.45 billion gallons or billion bushels of corn is what the industry will consume this year um, and consume that amount last year, which is which is right at 36 percent of the corn crop um, um, in the United States. So the demand side of the equation on ethanol is <clears throat> is where we tend to focus quite a bit. Um, if you look at the demand side domestically, you know, we're, pr we're producing 16.1, but we're only consuming um, about 14 to 14.5. Um, so that leaves one to 1.8 million of exports in order to clear the market of the excess uh, of the excess uh, supplies of ethanol. Um, when you talk about being, you know, an E10 blend wall, that 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 situation has been breached to a certain extent. But at 10.4 percent of the gasoline pool, it's not like we flew through it. Um, we've been we've been seeing some headwinds on higher octanes and greater blends, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, so on the demand side, you know, the domestic side is to me where we have a lot of work to do and where we have a lot more capacity, not only for ethanol, but by proxy corn. Um, so there's, there's several things that we're working on on that front. Just real quick on the exports. Um, we are going to have a rec record export this year, um, which is surprising with the strength of the dollar um, and some of the currency spreads that we see. But but we are going to have a record export year, and, and, and I'm glad we are because um, ethanol values would be substantially cheaper without the 1.8 billion gallons of exports that we're going to uh, ship this year. Most of that goes to Canada, about 45% of it. So um, after the, the USMTR um, trade relations with Canada have always been pretty solid, but um, between the USMTR and the Canadian Clean Fuel Standard, we're really starting to get consistent and strong uh, purchases out of Canada um, for, our, for our ethanol. Um, octane buyers overseas. Now, when we talk about octane buyers, ethanol really is just a cheap source of octane. So if you look at a country like India or Vietnam or even some others that that are going, okay, well, gasoline is 50 cents higher than, than ethanol, um, and ethanol is much cheaper than, than some of the other octanes like toluene and, you know, the carcinogens, benzene. Um, so those folks will buy the ethanol due to that spread. Now, we're starting to see that spread come back together with, with gasoline breaking in price here, um, and I think October front month futures were like $1.93 uh, yesterday. Uh, with ethanol being at about a dollar eighty one and we had that spread at around fifty to seventy five cents for most of the last year, and that's what helped to enable a lot of these exports but um, long term demand is really what I want to more focus on with ethanol and there are some there are definitely some headwinds there um, you know I mentioned we're we're at ten point four percent of the gas pool um, we'd like to be fifteen percent and we've been fighting that battle now for <laughs> I don't know, uh, 10, 15 years. Um, now we've received some emergency waivers this summer that allow us to blend up to E15 um, in, in conventional gasoline zones, but it's not a long-term solution. So we're, we're gonna continue working on that front, but the other headwinds we're facing are really electric vehicles and, 
And as Krista mentioned, some of the CAFE and greenhouse gas standards that came out um, are, are really onerous. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're going to be litigated. They're going to be heavily litigated. Um, but they do essentially put in place a de facto electric vehicle mandate if they're realized the way they've been set out. Um, you know, electric vehicles is, is a, lot of, uh, a lot of what has the ethanol industry um, and, and the corn industry a little bit concerned at this point. Um, because if you look at EIA's numbers, they do forecast some pretty sizable reductions in gasoline usage and corn usage by proxy um, in the next 20 years. And it's due to several reasons. It's due to the, the penetration of electric vehicles into, into the uh, light duty fleet, um, efficiencies that are going to be coming out in, in smaller motors. If you look at some of the Chevrolet offerings right now, I mean, they have 1.5 liter motors that get 35 miles to the gallon <clears throat> and they run on a little higher octane. Um, but the days of 20 miles to the gallon and 15 miles to the gallon are, are in the rear view mirror. So we're going to see, continue to see downward pressure um, on, eth on gasoline and ethanol usage from that. Now, the electric vehicles, the bloom is definitely coming off. Um, I remember a few Super Bowls ago and every commercial was an EV commercial and we're all gonna be 100% EVs by 2030. Now, definitely the consumer's pushing back a little bit on that, but there's definitely been some other things that have affected that. One, the infrastructure growth hasn't been there. Um, it's been very slow. Um, the pricing of these vehicles is starting to get a little bit um, out of whack with consumers, um, especially considering that gasoline prices at the time when ethanol uh, EVs were really popular, we had a $5 average U.S. gasoline price. I think yesterday it was $3.36. So the, the spread per mile has definitely come down on those. Um, the other thing is, you know, the, the potential for tariffs uh, on, on Chinese electric vehicles. So the market's really in a little bit of a turmoil right now in that electric vehicle space. And even Elon Musk is admitting that, you know, they're having some problems and that, you know, 100% battery electric vehicles may have to make way for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, um, which to me has made the most sense from the beginning. Um, so considering all these headwinds and considering, you know, the things that we know are coming down the pike from consumers who want lower carbon uh, fuel offerings, our politicians and regulators, um, yeah, we might have some some swings with changes in administrations, um, you know. But as but as a longtime conservative and, and someone who, who's more center center right, I, I've come to the realization that this stuff is here to stay, um, and we need to figure out ways to capitalize on it for the ag community, um, because a lot of this this is going to be a lot of the next new thing that hits the ag community and potentially um, offers an economic incentives for the ag community. So what are we as a company doing in this environment? Well, first of all, we're, we're fighting some of, these, some of these unfair regulations as best we can. We've got trade associations that work on our benefit, uh, Growth Energy Renewable Fuels Association. Um, so we're, we're fighting those, litigating those where we can, and I know Corn Grows is involved in, in, in a lot of that as well. Um, they tend to be very, very strong partners with the ethanol industry. Um, but there are some things we can do at the plant level to help us ensure that our product is marketable, not only today, but 10 years from today, when we're talking uh, about a potentially low carbon future. Um, Galva in particular is a plant that we're making a lot of changes at right now. Um, just, just this fall during our shutdown season, our, our plant shutdown season, um, we've had several upgrades. One of them is, is we're searching for efficiencies in that plant. We're searching for ways to lower our, our carbon footprint, basically lower our energy usage uh, in general. Um, the main thing we've done there is commission, and, and it will it's on site and being constructed now, but um, combined heat and power or cogeneration uh, is something that is called, is, is something that we're pursuing at Galva right now. What that's going to allow us to do, first and foremost, it's going to lower our carbon index score at the plant by seven to nine points, um, which is a pretty sizable move. Um, but it's also going to allow us to produce 
every bit of our own electricity that the plant needs, which is a, a pretty substantial amount, of, you know, around nine megawatts. So we're going to be able to produce all of that power and have no reliance on the grid whatsoever. Um, the way we do that is we turn a turbine, um, and it's really, it's really kind of neat the way it's set up. You, the turbine uh, runs on natural gas, but then we take the waste heat from that turbine and produce all of the steam needs for the plant um, through, through a, a, a boiler. So the efficiency, the efficiency allowed there um, is, is really amazing and something to behold. Um, we're also going to be, um, if you've been over to the plant lately, you've seen a smaller bin and a new, a new drag leg going up. Um, that's so we can grind our corn a little finer. finer. We've added two hammer mills um, and, and the entire setup. It allows us to lower our screen size. And what that does is it allows us to have better ethanol yield. So we produce more ethanol with the same inputs, i.e. you lower your CI score at that point. And you know, farmers will, will have similar opportunities when we get into the, the carbon uh, on farm practices. If you can grow 275 bushels with the same amount of nitrogen, I think in the future, you're going to be rewarded for that. Um, now that future, that, that's the uncertain part. Um, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, but decarbonization is, is a focus at our plants. We realize that it has to be. Um, as we move into the future. Um, so in addition to combined heat and power and finer grind, um, we are launching what we call a pilot uh, CI feedstock program this year, which means basically we're going to look at the inputs, uh, the CI inputs of our corn, um, because under the 45Z tax credit, an ethanol plant like ours has scope one, two, and three emissions. Scope one is what goes out our stack, Scope three are the emissions associated with products that we buy, i.e. our corn. So what this program is going to do, it's going to be a pilot program in 2024 um, because, as somebody mentioned, we, we don't have the guidelines yet on this 45Z tax credit. The, the Treasury is being very slow to get that, get that out there. Um, but this pilot program will basically allow us to learn the rules of the road, um, get the protocols in place and get everything set up for a program in 2025 um, that, is, that is more robust and open to um, hopefully more of our producers and corn suppliers. Um, again, the, the 45Z rules, which are should have been out at least by the end of this year, the indications I'm getting um, from some of our, our Washington contacts is we probably won't see those regulations and rules until 2025. Um, and I think everyone can probably guess why the election year is, is really, uh, things just kind of come to a grinding halt in DC when we have an election year, unfortunately. Um, so what are all these things going to allow us to do, not only today, but hopefully in 10 years? Well. First of all, obviously, we have to compete with electric vehicles on our carbon footprint. We can do that. We're ready to do that today. Um, if we look at Galva again and West Burlington, our decarbonization efforts um, does entail carbon capture and sequestration. Now, we're just getting started on this path. Um, you know, we had a situation with pipelines oh, two years ago where we thought we had this put to bed, um, but the pipelines just weren't able to gain the traction they needed. So um, we are looking at alternative ways to sequester carbon. Um, honestly, for the 30 point reduction you get in carbon sequestration, it's the, it's the biggest reduction you can do with any single, with any single project at a facility. Um, how that's gonna play out yet, we don't know for sure yet, but we do, we, we, we realize that we are going to have to decarbonize um, and get started on that sooner rather than later. Um, anyway, going back to uh, the opportunities, um, yes, we're going to compete with EVs on carbon. We need to do that. Um, it's going to give us access to what's called low carbon fuel markets. Um, if you look at some of the Western states or even Canada has a clean fuel uh, standard now um, that, that either rewards or, or disincentivizes uh, fuel that has a higher or lower CI. Um, so we intend to take uh, participate in those. 
um, it opens the door at that point once you have a low carbon fuel offering to sustainable aviation fuel. And this is going to be a big one if, if, if the industry can get this pulled together. Uh, there's one plant that is producing in Georgia. Um, it's a Lonza jet plant. Um, I know Jivo was working on a big facility in South Dakota that, that uh, is in process. But the amount of, of ethanol that could potentially be funneled into that market is, is amazingly large. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big market that is a very hard one to decarbonize. So there's a, there's a huge amount of potential there. But table stakes is being decarbonized and have, having a low CI score. Without that, um, you're, you're basically you're, you're going to be in the fuel pool um, and, and likely not receive any type of premium. Um, lastly, as we decarbonize our corn supply or our ethanol supplies, it gives us a little bit more uh, leg to stand on when it comes to renewable fuel standards and increasing the amount of corn uh, included in the renewable fuel standards, the amount of corn ethanol. Um, last, just to wrap up here, uh, you know, I know I know Jake was wanting us to be hopeful, but. But Chris's numbers on corn are, are, are correct, 183 bushels. Um, and that's, that's really good news for the yield side. The bad news is somebody told the folks in Chicago at the CBOT about the size of this crop, and now you have, you have uh, cash corn below the cost of production. And it's an unfortunate situation. Um, you know, w we grow this crop. American farmers about 1.7 bushels every year. That's about 150 million bushels every year that this crop gets bigger. Um, and if you combine that with with a potential loss of demand in gasoline, and Chris's number here again is right, it's about a billion gallons a year if we lose 15 to 20 percent of our gasoline demand due to EVs. The combination of that increase in corn uh, corn yields and potential downward pressure on demand is very concerning to me. We need to have a focus 10 years out. We need to be looking at higher blends of ethanol. We know that we have a low carbon offering that could be utilized in greater quantities. Um, and it's time to do that. It's time to move on that. So anyway, thank you.